Okay, so your questions. You see, the idea is, if you just skip the technical details, most of the job we had already done when we were discussed on Friday. We had these potentials and the vector potentials and they were written in term, in the, at least in the Lorentz gauge, they satisfy this uh, wave equation with a, for, with a driving force. So you can just think of the analog in the string case would be you have a string and on the string there is an external force applying at different parts of the string at different times. So it will be the analog of this expression over there. And then we, at this, we didn't drive it, but I, we just claim that this is the solution of our equation. Our equation has this form, and of course we have all these derivations which are kind of technically boring, but at the end of the day, we just show that, that these are the solutions of my wave equation. And you see, whatever the row is, it can be changing in time or constant, it can be homogeneous or I don't know, whatever the charge density is, whatever the current density is, these are the, the scalar and vector potentials created by those uh, changing time, uh, changing charge and current densities. We are not making any assumption here anymore. In ele electrostatics, we had assumed that nothing depends on time. In magnetostatics, we had assumed that nothing depends on time. In induction, we had assumed that, okay, things are changing, but the changes are not that fast. But here, these are valid, whatever the, how, no matter how fast the, the changes are. So basically, these are the final results of the sol final solutions of the Maxwell's equations. Now, of course, we need to look for the uh, electric and magnetic fields. So what are the corresponding expressions for the electric and magnetic fields? So let's try to calculate them. The electric field was minus the gradient of phi minus the time derivative of the vector potential, which is equal to, well, if you look at phi, <coughs> d cubed r prime 1 over 4 pi epsilon. Now, the gradient of rho, you see, we have two terms, one the gradient of rho, one the gradient of 1 over r minus r prime. <coughs> Now the gradient of one over r minus r prime just gives us the rho r prime tr r minus r prime divided by r minus r prime cube. Well, this is the familiar expression from electrostatics. So here I just took the gradient of one over r minus r prime. But keep in mind that the r dependence is not only in the r minus r prime, rho also depends on r through tr, the retarded time. So if we are to take the derivative of the retarded of the rho with, re if you take the gradient of rho with respect to r, we would get rho dot r prime tr times one over c times the gradient of r minus r prime. Well, there is one minus over here. There is another minus in the definition of TR. So that's why there is no additional minus signs. And you see, <coughs> now when we were looking at the so-called quasi-static approximation, we said that, okay, maybe there are some changes in the system, there might be some time-dependent changes, but as long as th that time-dependent changes are not fast, in that case, we can use the quasi-static quasi approximation. So you see, this is the correction to our quasi-static approximation. Well, one correction is due to this TR, this is the other correction, and you see that these corrections are inversely proportional to the speed of light. So if the changes are slow compared to the speed of light, then you can safely neglect these terms. Okay, so these two are the gradient of phi. Now we have the, also this time derivative over here, and that just brings a factor
of mu epsilon minus mu epsilon j dot r prime tr over r minus r prime and keep in mind mu epsilon is nothing but 1 over c squared So this is my electric field for an arbitrary charge distribution and current density. Overall space. You see, I have to be. I'm integrating over all my charges in my system. You see, I'm taking the gradient with respect to the coordinate r. If you look at rho, if you look at rho, well, r prime doesn't depend on r. Rho depends on r only through tr. Tr is depends on r. So when I'm take, I'm, I am taking the gradient of rho with respect to r. But that is proportional to the derivative of rho with respect to its second argument. That is why I have the rho dot. This term over here, by the way, I forgot that 1 over r minus r prime. This term over here is the gradient of rho, all of this. And that one over r minus r prime is this one. All of this is the gradient of rho. Here up to here. Now let's look at B. Remember, this is the curl of A. And again, A depends on R. Keeping this there, curl is with respect to R again. A depends on R both through, through this, that factor 1 over R minus R prime, also through that TR. So those two things we have to take into account. So this will be equal to d cubed r prime mu over 4 pi j cross r minus r prime over r minus r prime cube. Uh, let me write the arguments also. This j at the point r at the time, r prime at the time tr. Well, this is nothing but the expression of b when we ignore any time dependence. This is the magnetostatic expression for b. And then we have this uh, dependence due to the position dependence of TR. So it will be plus J dot R prime TR cross 1 over C gradient of R minus R prime divided by r minus r prime. Again, this is the 
contribution due to the time dependence of the current. Yes. This whole thing over here is the curl of J. And the curl of J is the derivative of J with respect to TR times the derivative of TR with respect to the positions. Do they match? Are you sure that they don't match? Well, let's see. If you just come, oh, that row, yeah. Just think of it like this. If you have, if, and these equations are valid in electrostatics also. In electrostatics, B is zero, E is non-zero. So they are definitely not related with each other. Well, what you can try, I don't know, maybe this row that you can write as the divergence of J if you want, and get take do an integration by part, maybe. Well, I don't think you can just relate one to the other one. We will see, well, you see, what, what we already know, what we will show, let's say, in empty space, in a region where there are no charges and currents, they will be related. That, that will be something different. For a point charge that's moving at constant velocity, for example, they will be related. Now, these are called these last two. Let me just check the sign if I, let me not miss anything. Well, these are what's called the Jeffy Menko's equations. Well, pro for practical applications, most of the time this won't be so relevant because most of the time it will be easier to evaluate these phi and A integrals first and then for a given J and rho and then take their derivatives to obtain the E and the B field. But just for the sake of records, let's say, these are your uh, E and B fields. Now let's, let's calculate the potentials for a point charge. Uh, that's something we are interested in. So we have a point charge that's moving with a given velocity. So what will be the corresponding potentials? So we are given the trajectory of this point particle. So what will be the corresponding potentials and the electric and magnetic fields? Well, let's stop with the potentials. Once you obtain the potential, the rest is just taking derivatives. Well, what is the charge density at the point R? for this point charge Q. Q. So it's constant everywhere. What is the charge, volume charge density of this particle? So it's only at the origin. It's not nowhere else. Yes. 
r minus omega t. It is at the point omega t at the time t. This is my charge density. And my current density is just q v of t Dirac delta of r minus omega t, where v of t is nothing but the time derivative of omega. So these are my <coughs> volume and current densities, charge and current densities. Now let's start with the electrostatic potential at the point r at the time t. This will be equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon q r minus omega of tr divided by r minus r prime, d cubed r prime. This will be equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, q over omega at tr minus r, r minus omega of tr. With one catch. You see, that TR depends also on R prime. So inside the Dirac delta, we actually have a complicated function of R prime. So just like, you see, if you have Dirac delta of F of X, this integral multiplied with some function g of x is equal to, it's not equal to just g of x0. It is equal to g of x0 divided by the derivative of f at the point x0. And if there are more than one x0 values that make f of x equal to 0, you just sum over x zeros. Similarly, if you have the three-dimensional di three analog This is equal to g of omega of tr divided by the gradient omega of tr. Absolute value. So we have to correct that the above expression is 1 over the gradient with respect to r prime of r prime minus, no, this is the divergence, sorry, minus omega of tr. We are keep in mind that r prime is a solution of this equation. So for a given omega, what you should do is, for a given functional form omega, you should find the r prime vector that satisfies this equation. Obtain that value, evaluate these expressions, and in these expressions everywhere, instead of r prime, put this your solution. Now, what is the gradient with respect to R divergence with respect to R prime of R prime minus omega T minus R prime over C? 
Again, let's use the index notation. This will be del over del xi prime of xi prime minus omega i t minus r. Let me write tr. Keep in mind that tr also depends on xi prime. So this was equal to 3 minus omega i dot times del of del over that with respect to xi prime derivative of tr. And tr is t minus r minus r prime over c. If you take those derivatives, this is equal to 3 minus omega i dot tr. That derivative is minus 1 over c xi minus xi prime over r minus r prime. Three minus v. Oh, this is nothing but v i at v at the time t r. One over c. This is r minus r prime divided by r minus r prime. What is V? V, I defined it to be omega dot. R dot, if you want. Omega is the position. So what we end up having, phi of R of T, is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, 1 over r minus omega of tr, times 1 over 3 plus 1 over c v of t r, r minus r prime divided by r minus r prime. And keep in mind, <coughs> r prime is omega tr. So here, this is my r prime. If you open the parentheses, phi of rt, this is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, 1 over, well, I made a small mistake somewhere, 3 r minus omega of tr plus 1 over c v of tr dot r minus omega of tr. Well, I know that I made a mistake, basically because this is, <coughs> I also have a cube. It should reduce to the case of a stationary point charge when the omega of t is a constant. So v is zero. Uh, for a point charge at rest, I already know the solution. I mean, you see, this solution is the general one for a general point charge moving with an arbitrary velocity at arbitrary times, but a point charge at rest also satisfy all, satisfies all the conditions, and a point charge at rest has V of t is equal to zero, so this term is absent. This is whatever the position is, let's call it R zero. So the, the potential should be 1 over 4 pi epsilon or epsilon or epsilon 0 q over r minus 
R0. There is no 3. So there is a mistake somewhere in my derivation. No, you see, this is the solution for an arbitrary charge doing an arbitrary motion. And its position at the time t is given by omega t. But I, this should be valid for any omega of t. Special case, omega of t is equal to r0. This result should also be valid. This is valid. This should be valid for any omega t. It should also be valid for this special case. But for that special case, I already know the solution. That is the point charge at rest at the position R0. So the potential should be phi of RT is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon q over R minus R0. There is no 3. That is the term that is wrong. That is where I made the, the mistake. Now, what is the mistake? Is this true? Is this the generalization of the one dimensional case to the three dimensional case? As your friend points out, that three is due to this term over here. No, that's the divergence. No, it's only the Dirac delta. It's only I know that it's definitely the only the, this Dirac delta that whose derivative I should take over here, not g's. So I check this. <coughs> Is this valid? How do you check it? Hmm? Derivative of what? How do you derive this relation? How do you derive that property of the Dirac delta? Hmm? You see, one word doesn't win the prize. Give me an explanation. Give me a derivation. Well, let's see, the Dirac delta function is zero almost everywhere, so its derivative is zero almost everywhere, which is not a step function. Step function is zero in half of the space and one in the other half. It's definite, it's the derivative of the Dirac, the step function that is the Dirac delta. Anyway, let's not lose that much time over here. So that is homework for you. This term is not there. So what is the correct expression?
Apparently, that is not the correct expression. So the bonus would be how to get rid of that three. That's not the correct form. My guess is that this is not correct. So that's where my guess is that's where we made a mistake. Or maybe that is true, but we made a mistake somewhere else. Okay, so we know the potential. Well, the vector potential basically has the same expression. Let's see. In the case of the scalar potential, we just put this function. In the case of vector potential, we just use, to obtain the components of the vector potential, we just use the components of J. And if you just compare them, the only difference is that Instead of just Q, we now have Q times the components of V. So A is just 1 over 4 pi, now mu over 4 pi, Q times V at the time T. Now let me check that. Is this at the time T or TR? Or let's, let's go, let's look at that. R minus omega of TR plus V of at TR divided by C times R minus omega TR. Now the question is, is that velocity at the time T or at the time TR? Well, it should be at the time TR because J to start with was evaluated at the time TR. So it's not T, it's TR. So A of R of T is basically mu epsilon zero over mu, no, mu zero over epsilon, mu zero times epsilon zero times V at T R times phi at the time R of T. Now, for a point charge, for phi and A, their, their relation is kind of easy. Point charge. This is for a point charge. We are looking at only a point charge. If you want the charge density, these are the expressions. You don't get a simple relation between phi and A in that case. But for a point charge, phi and A are related. Well, you see, if A is proportional to V, the velocity of the point charge. A is zero, it's at rest. So what about a point charge that is moving at constant velocity? Now phi RT is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q over R minus omega T. Now R minus V of omega T R plus V 
over C R minus omega TR. And A, well, once we can evaluate phi, A will be just 1 over C squared V times phi. So the critical thing will be the evaluation of phi. And omega TR is just R0. It will start from some point, R0 plus V of T. Now, the difficulty here is, how do we determine TR? You see, what we need to do is, first we, need, well, we don't need to determine TR, but we need to determine R prime. And R prime is the solution of, R prime is equal to R zero plus V times T minus R minus R prime over C. R prime is the solution of this one. Once we determine R prime, then we know what this TR is, this TR over there. TR will be just T minus R minus R prime over C for the determined R prime. Now, what is actually happening over here? So let me first sketch it, uh, in fact, for the previous case. This is my part, the trajectory of my particle. Now, if you want, you can just assume an arbitrary trajectory. And I would like to find the uh, potentials at the point R at the time T. My particle at the time T might be over here. But it arrived at that point from this point, so it's moving in this direction, this is my V. This is at the time T. This is at the time TR, earlier time. And it is this position of my particle that determines the potential at this point. So this is basically what we are kind of trying to determine. But of course we have to solve that equation first. Any ideas? You see, what we need to determine actually is R minus omega of TR. Potential. You see what we are doing. We have this point particle that is moving at a constant speed. And we would like to find the electric and magnetic fields corresponding to this particle moving at a constant speed. Now we already know the potential, the electric. Uh, static uh, scalar and the vector potential corresponding to a particle that is moving at an arbitrary velocity at a given time. So we are just, we already, we, we, we are trying to specialize to the case that the velocity is just a constant. It doesn't change in time. But of course, if we want to use these expressions over here, we have to determine what TR is. For a given T and R value, what is TR? What is the position of my particle at the time TR? So if my particle was initially over here. Initially, it's at that point. This is the position at which I'm looking for my potential. At that time, my particle is over here. But the potential is not determined by this point, by the pot by, but by this point over here. 
by the position of my particle at an earlier time tr. Omega is the position of my particle. You see, I, the position of my particle is given by this expression. Omega is the position. So if it's moving at constant velocity, the position of my particle at the time t is equal to r0 plus v of t. Now I need to determine, for this case, I need to determine basically well, in fact, I need to determine this, that distance. You see, if you look at these expressions over here, it depends at, on the dis difference of o r minus omega of tr. So this is my vector. This vector is r minus omega of tr. That is the vector I'm trying to find. Now this is omega of t. This is omega of tr. This is omega of t. This is r. And this one over here is r minus omega tr. And we are trying to find that one. Well, you see, I have basically two terms. I have the, I need r minus omega tr. That is one thing I need. I also need r minus omega tr. Scalar the product with v, which is magnitude of r minus omega tr times v times cosine theta. Let me put theta r. This is my theta r. These are the things I will need. Theta r? Well, the angle, uh, you see, this is my v. Theta is the angle between v and this relative po position. Well, of course, first we need also need to choose what are we trying to express these expressions in terms of. Uh, what I would like to do is I would like to express all of these expressions in terms of this distance and this angle. That is what we will do Wednesday. Okay, uh, this Friday I will not be here. So there won't be any lecture. We won't have a lecture on Friday, but your assistant will be here to do the recitation on Friday. Well, since I won't be doing lectures on Friday, on Wednesday we will do one hour of lecture. And also next week we will also do the, our second hour of lecture. I know that some of you have overlapping courses in the second hour, so I will not be doing lectures on the second hour. But for two weeks, I will be doing lectures for one hour to cover to recover uh, our missing day. Okay, so on Wednesday we will finish this. No. On the exam, at the beginning, I will not be here, but I will probably come back, come to the department at middle at the middle of the exam. Now, I will be here before you finish the exam. The exam will be on the fourth floor in the room, in the classroom 422 at 13, well, let me write midterm on April 1st. It won't be an April 1st joke, the exam. At 13, 30, I mean, we will and we will officially start at 13.40, but I mean, if you come at 13.30, you will get your exam paper. 
an in P422. It is the class, one of the classrooms at the end of my, at, at the end of the corridor where my office is. Will this topic be in the exam? Will you give Sure. <laughs> I mean, since we are, the last course we will have will be on Wednesday, you still have some time to review some of these topics. Since there's no Muslim 